It is seven o'clock. Good to see you this morning. And it is a bad day for the world's biggest social network as WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram all go dark and their shares plunge. We're live at the company's California headquarters to ask exactly what went wrong. Plus, new powers to curb climate protests, as well as a promise to do more to address violence against women and girls. We'll be speaking to the policing minister, Kit Malthouse, in just a few minutes' time. Uh, but also this morning, climate concerns. I'm going to be joined by the Prime Minister's father, Stanley Johnson, to talk about the government's green strategy ahead of the COP26 summit. Also coming up... Uh, well, it's garage music, but not quite as you might know it. From a carport in Surrey to the top of the American charts, I'll be speaking to the singer, who became an overnight sensation after three decades of trying. It is Tuesday, the 5th of October. Status updates. Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, all back online after a global outage that paralysed the world's biggest social networks. But what exactly caused it? I'm live at Facebook headquarters in California as the tech giant does damage control and says sorry after its biggest ever crash. I'm live at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester for a big day on law and order as the Home Secretary promises to get tough on motorway protesters. I'm live in Beijing as China sends a record number of aircraft into Taiwan's air defense zone, ratcheting up regional tensions and drawing condemnation from the US. How nearly half the toys bought online through third-party sellers could harm kids. A life-saving drug for a rare blood disorder. The first sickle cell treatment in 20 years is rolled out in England. The language of genocide now being used in Ethiopia's brutal civil war. We'll have a special report at half past nine. Morning all. Uh, we begin with a status update. The world's biggest social network is back online after an outage that lasted several hours. Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram all crashed last night with millions of users unable to send or receive messages or refresh their news feeds. Uh, well, the outage had an impact on three of the company's core products, social networks, Facebook and Instagram, as well as the messaging service WhatsApp, affecting an estimated 3 billion combined users. The website monitoring service Down Detector said it was the largest such failure it had ever seen with 10.6 million problems reported globally. And with shares falling almost 5% yesterday, the company lost £34.8 billion in market value, almost $50 billion. Facebook has now confirmed that a faulty configuration change caused the outage. The company has also said that there is no evidence to suggest that user data was compromised. Our US correspondent Mark Stone has this morning's first report. A wheel and a word on screens globally and representing an outage with implications which grew hour by hour. It was just before 9am yesterday at Facebook HQ in California when staff noticed a problem. Within minutes across the globe, Facebook was down and with it its affiliate platforms Instagram and WhatsApp. An estimated 3 billion users, social networks, business networks, all cut off. But after more than five hours, which showed just how dependent the world has become on Facebook, it was back. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp and Messenger are coming back online now, founder Mark Zuckerberg said. Sorry for the disruption today. I know how much you rely on our services to stay connected with the people you care about. The outage came just hours after a former Facebook employee accused the company of putting profits before safety with a damning series of accusations. Facebook has realised that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. Facebook has said that to suggest it encourages bad content and does nothing is not true, and there is no suggestion that there's any link between the outage and the accusations. The whistleblower Francis Hogan will testify here before Congress later. 
Governments globally have been concerned for some time about the company's reach, its influence and its safeguards. In our view, this is just the latest in a series of revelations about social media platforms uh, that make clear that self-regulation is not working. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg has repeatedly defended his company in Congress and beyond. This latest challenge puts the spotlight again on profound questions for Facebook. It shows, too, just how drawn so many of us are to the products of one private, self-regulated company. Mark Stone, Sky News in Washington. Uh, well, our US correspondent Greg Milam joins us now from Facebook HQ in Menlo Park in California. Uh, morning, Greg. Well, that's an evening that Facebook would wish never to see repeated. Yeah, and usually these, these outages in the tech world last about an hour, and it's of the scale and scope of this one that has got so much attention. As Mark said there, uh, five hours uh, of it, even when it started to get back to normal, it was very, very slow and sporadic before people had everything up and running. They've apologised, they've said thanks to their users because they realise uh, what was at stake for many of those users. It's not just about posting pictures and status updates for, for hundreds of thousands of people all around the world. This was about their ability to do business. They run their businesses through uh, Facebook. WhatsApp has two, million, two billion users. For many of those people, it is their only form of uh, communication. And they felt very vulnerable without that or without the ability uh, to do business. It shows how much Facebook is now part of critical infrastructure in the US and, and around the world. Even Facebook's own engineers trying to get to the root of this problem found that the bits of it that were down meant they, they couldn't, um, couldn't get to the, the cause of that problem. It even slowed down the recovery. So it shows you how significant it is. They've, they've said the cause wasn't malicious. They found out that it was this, what they call networking uh, instruction uh, problem, but they've put right. But big questions and a lot of those businesses wondering whether it's good to rely on Facebook when something like today happens. Greg, many thanks indeed. Well, let's turn our attention now to the Conservative Party conference, joining us from Manchester. Uh, once again on the programme, the Minister for Crime and Policing, Kit Malthouse. Good to see you this morning, Minister. Uh, and don't worry, I will not be quizzing you on your WhatsApp uh, group this morning. Uh, instead, I do want to talk about a bit of video uh, that emerged yesterday, actually filmed not too far away from, from my neck of the woods here in London, which showed a paramedic pulling one of the members of Insulate Britain from the middle of the road. Something needs to be done about this now, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, this is really distressing stuff that's emerging now. And while we obviously all value the right to protest, there is a dif difference between causing disruption and causing damage. Uh, we believe that these protesters and some of the others that we've seen in the last uh, couple of years have crossed the line uh, between exercising their right but also their responsibility towards the rest of us and something needs to be done. And so today we're going to be announcing a raft of new measures alongside those that are already in the Police Crime Courts and Sentencing Bill that's going through the House of Lords at the moment that we think will help deal with this problem specifically recognising that disruption of infrastructure and disruption of the strategic road network is of a different scale of damage, if you like, to the rest of us uh, than you would otherwise find with a normal protest. So you'll be hearing more about that later today. Why did the injunction that the, that the government sought at the High Court, why was that not sufficient to bring an end to these protests? Well, it's a good question, uh, Niall, not least because most people will respond to an injunction because obviously injunction is effectively a kind of civil warning that if you fail to obey the injunction, there will be consequences. Now, to get to that consequences step, because it's a civil procedure, we have to apply to the High Court, the injunction has to be served, a committal hearing has to be scheduled, and those people have to have the chance to appear to defend themselves, and that all takes time. In the meantime, while the police can arrest these uh, protesters and charge them for obstructing the highway, the charge at the moment isn't severe enough that they can be detained in custody pending an appearance in court. That means that these people in particular are then free to go and repeat offend as we've seen. Um, now eventually, given that they are, as far as I can see, in breach of that injunction, they will appear in front of a judge and face the wrath of that judge. But in the meantime, we need to think about this particular legal loophole, if you like, to give the police more power to deal with this very severe disruption. And you and I have both heard the really distressing stories about people struggling to get to hospital, for God's sake. I mean, the leader saying, I see in the media today, uh, that he would stand in the way of somebody who was dying in an ambulance uh, in order to make his point. Well, we just don't think that's acceptable. It's crossing the line and as I say we'll be we'll be taking strong measures to deal with it. 
Um, the, the other big topic that will be touched on uh, by the Home Secretary later on today is, is violence against women. And I hope you don't mind that we devote the rest of our time together to, to, to dealing with this particular topic. She's expected to say yeah. uh, that she's redoubling her efforts to ensure women and girls feel safer. Do you accept the fact that in this country we have a problem with violence against women? Oh, yes, I think we all accept that. Um, and that's why earlier this summer we published a violence against women and girls strategy, why we commissioned the inspector for constabulary to look at the policing of violence against women and, and girls. We had a report on that earlier this summer. Obviously, over the last couple of years, I've been policing minister, and we've done a lot of work in this area, particularly concentrating, for example, on domestic murder and domestic violence. And I've been leading the work in the government on the regrettably, you know, disgracefully low conviction rates that we have around rape and sexual assault. So there's been a lot of work that's been ongoing. But look, we still have a, a problem um, in this country that's been encapsulated in the response to some of the horrible murders, not least Sarah Everard and, and Sabina Nessa that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, to which we as a government have to respond. Um, and the fact that the, there are too many women and girls out there who just feel unsafe in the public realm does demand that we constantly increase and reinforce our efforts to make sure that they and everybody else feel safe. Sure, but, but, but this has, let, let's be fair about it, this has happened on your watch. The Conservatives have been in power since, in, since 2010. So rather than judging you on the promises that you're making right now, shouldn't we be, be judging you on that, on that record that you have just mentioned? Rape convictions at a low. They have dropped so significantly over the past five years that when the rape review came out in June of this year, the Victims Commissioner, Vera Baird, said this, what we are witnessing is the decriminalisation of rape. Why should anyone trust the Conservatives to be able to sort this out? Well, look, we have obviously apologised uh, profoundly for that fall. The reasons behind it are complicated um, and to do with issues of disclosure in court and a loss of confidence, if you like, between the police and the CPS about dealing with those watch. cases. What I, well, what I think people want to see is that we are very focused on this issue and we've pledged to try and drive those numbers up. And as I say, I'm leading that uh, task force. We've been doing that for the last uh, few months to try and restore that institutional confidence, if you like, and people coming forward. Now, I would say that during that same period, the confidence of people to come forward and report that crime has increased very significantly. So we've seen a big rise in reporting um, uh, over the last four or five years. We have to respond to that operationally and make sure that more of those cases to get into court. But it's worth but, bearing but, but in mind... But they're not, but they're just is, not. Looking... And again, as you say, in the rape review, ministers collectively said they were deeply ashamed. Understandable, given the fact since 2016-17... The volume of cases prosecuted has dropped by 60%. The amount of convictions that we're securing has further dropped. Women do not feel safe on the streets. Uh, honestly, right now, for the Conservatives to describe themselves as the party of, uh, party of law and order would be somewhat hubristic, wouldn't it? I don't think so. I mean, I think that's unfair, right? I mean, we are obviously trying to propose a strong package of messages which will give people a sense of security in the public realm. Women and girls, obviously, primary amongst those groups. The Prime Minister came into office, whatever, two years ago, um, and having been a crime-fighting mayor in London with a proud history, I have to say, of dealing with violence against women and girls, we published at City Hall the first ever strategy to deal with this issue uh, in the country and in a major capital city around the world. This has been a thread of activity for him, and I have to that's, say, that, me, that's great. over that's more great. than but a decade. Back in June, you had the opportunity to actually do something about it. Yep, it was in terms of an opposition day, but we, you, you voted against the full rollout of Section 28, which would allow for the cross-examination of vulnerable witnesses to be pre-recorded rather than take place in court. You also voted against making street harassment a specific crime. You had an opportunity to do something about it, admittedly presented by the Labour Party, but rather than hold your nose and do it, you voted against it. No, that, I mean, again, I think you're mischaracterising the nature of those debates in the, in the House. And by the way, what happens in the House of Commons very often has little to do with what actually happens out there on the street. So, for example, on your Section 28 point, we have rolled out Section 28 for vulnerable victims to every single Crown Court in the land, and we are at the moment carefully rolling it out in these cases to a specific number of Crown Courts to make sure that it, it works and it embeds. Because, of course, Section 28, while it, it, it is obviously of use for victims who feel vulnerable to give their uh, testimony early, it does present cross-examination problems later down the line. Now, we need to make sure that in the interests of justice that we 
we roll that out in a proportionate and a fair way rather than just a blanket easy solution. And it's worth remembering, Neil, that these are very, very complicated and difficult crimes, some of the most difficult to investigate and prosecute. And while it's, it's easy uh, for the Labour Party to, to make these big, bold claims, you know, we need to be focused on results. And that no, means no, no one is sure denying that these crimes are difficult to confidence. prosecute, Minister. No one is mm -hmm. denying that. But the reason it is so difficult to prosecute is because of the cuts that you have made to the system. Since 2010, the CPS has faced a 25% budget cut, 30% reduction in staff. Police forces in England and Wales have lost 22,000 officers between March 2010 and March 2018. You're building them back up again, but fair enough, they're still historically low. The Ministry of Justice has seen its budget cut by 25% up until 2019-2020. Those are the actions that you have taken, and we are seeing the outcomes. No, I don't think that's fair, and I wouldn't connect the two. Uh, I mean, obviously, for the first... Robert Butland whatever, connected five, the two. Oh, hold on. The, the, the previous Justice just, Secretary connected finish? the two. Like all parts of the public service, big choices were made in the last decade because of the position that we all faced economically, and that, that cuts were a factor, I think is self-evidently the case. Robert Buckland said that. Well, I'm afraid I disagree with him, and I can point you to an example, right? When, when the Prime Minister and I were at City Hall, uh, when we arrived in 2008, uh, knife crime was rising very significantly. At the time, police officer numbers in London were an all-time high, and Gordon Brown was spending money like water on all the things that you've talked about. Now, we managed to get those numbers down against a background of, of cuts that we were making to the Metropolitan Police budget because we had to. The country was facing a financial crisis. And over the first five years of that term or so, crime fell. Now, obviously, things have to move, and crime is agile, and times change, and so we have to be as well. And what we're trying to do is design a package of criminal justice policies and capacity and capability that will deal with the challenges we face now. And they are very different to the challenges that were faced 10 years ago. Some of those, like the issue we've talked about, about rape, come about because of uh, developments in the criminal justice system and developments in society. Others of them, like the, the growth in online fraud, are because of developments in technology. And what I think the British public yep. want to see is a government which is committed and agile in that response, and that is what I think you'll see today on the, on the conference floor. Yeah, no one, least of all me, will criticise this government if they manage to improve the rape conviction rate. But it does rather feel that it has taken the rape and murder of a young woman by a serving police officer to give you all a kick up the backside to try and do something about this. Well, I, again, while this is obviously a dreadful, dreadful event and it has encapsulated a feeling in the country, I think that's unfair too. The Rape Review, looking at this issue of the fall in rape uh, convictions, was initiated two years ago um, uh, to do a root and branch review of what was going wrong in the system. We're seeing the fruits of that work now. You know, the Violence of Women Against Girls strategy was initiated, I think, 18 months ago, published in July this year, again, engaging with the sector to work out what we need to do. So there have been lots and lots of strands of work around this. But look, Neil, you know, the fight against crime is never ending. And I think what the British people want to know is that we are dedicated, that we are bothered, that we are being industrious and throwing everything we can at it. And as I say, we are designing a system which can deal with the challenges of today rather than argue about the challenges of a decade ago. And I think and hope that people will start to feel that in the years to come. Minister, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, still to come on the programme at five past eight, I'll be discussing public trust in the police force uh, with Graham Wett, uh, former police officer and, of course, policing commentator. At 20 past eight, I'll be speaking to the chief executive of a logistics firm about the ongoing supply crisis and the government's plans to recruit more HGV drivers. And at half past eight, I'll be speaking to Stanley Johnson about his passion to tackle climate change ahead of the COP26 summit. Uh, now, China has flown a record number of fighter planes towards Taiwan amidst growing fears of further escalation causing condemnation from the White House. Uh, let's bring in our Asia correspondent, Tom Cheshire, joining us from Beijing. Morning, Tom. Just how concerned should we be about this? 
It's pretty remarkable, Neil, that just the number involved. We see a lot of these incursions into Taiwan's air defense zone, but when it was 56 yesterday that made the flight, um, it's just a huge number and something we weren't necessarily expecting. Um, there is a reason for this, a background for this. It's China's National Day. It's been a holiday here, a holiday all week. And to celebrate that, they often have some sort of military display. It's just taking place near Taiwan this time. But I think also the context in the region is really, really important. You have, of course, the AUKUS Security Alliance, uh, the new alliance between Australia, UK and US and those nuclear submarines announced quite recently. Uh, you had a Royal Navy ship uh, go down the Taiwan Strait and also the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier is doing joint exercises with other navies, including Japan in the region. You've also got Japan talking publicly about its deepening ties with Taiwan. And I think this is what China can do to say it's not going to be uh, boxed in by these moves. It's still going to fly these flights. And the other very important thing, uh, the US uh, State Department, they put out a statement saying that China China should cease its operations after a record-breaking day. Uh, immediately after that, there's even another record-breaking day. So China showing it is not going to back down here. But although there is this difficult uh, diff uh, increase in quantity, the quality is the same. They've been making these incursions for a time. What would be more dangerous, more foreboding, is if it changes from the air defense identification zone, which actually extends over mainland China, and it doesn't, not breaking international law, to flights over Taiwan itself. We're not there yet, but it's certainly a dangerous moment here. Uh, and in the region. Tom, many thanks. Love this. The latest James Bond film has smashed box office records, generating £25 million in three days in the UK and Ireland. James, fate draws us back ah, together. Oh, what's going to be there? There it is. Yeah, No Time to Die had the highest opening weekend of any film in the near 60-year history of the Bond franchise, topping its predecessors, Skyfall and Spectre. It's taken 89 million quid internationally and looks set uh, to break even more records. And I'm going to see it later on today. Uh, let's take a quick look at some of the other stories making the news this morning. And two doses of the Pfizer coronavirus jab are 90% effective in preventing people going to hospital with COVID-19, including the Delta variant, for at least six months. Researchers found that vaccine effectiveness against all variants waned during the six-month study period. They say their research underscores the importance of increasing vaccination rates around the world. Right, well, let's take a look at the latest domestic COVID data. And there have been a further 35,077 new cases reported in the latest 24 hours. A further 33 people have died after contracting COVID, taking the total number of people who've died within 28 days of a test to 136,986. Meanwhile, 24,123 first doses of a COVID vaccine were given. 21,532 received their second. Nearly 45 million people have now had two doses. Around 22% of filling stations in London and the South East still do not have fuel, according to the Petrol Retailers Association. Around 200 military personnel, half of them drivers, are being deployed to the roads for the first time to help deliver petrol to four courts. The Chancellor said the government will do all it can to mitigate global supply issues, but did not rule out Christmas being affected. An emergency operation is underway to contain a spillage of over 100,000 gallons of crude oil off the coast of California. It's turned one of the, uh, into the state's most popular beaches jet black, littered with dead, uh, dead birds and fish. Authorities say the leak is no longer active. They're investigating whether it was caused by a ship's anchor hitting the pipeline. But environmental activists say that this isn't the first time such a disaster has occurred. And so long as the United States depends on oil, it won't be the last. Uh, let's have a quick look at the impact of climate change on the planet. The top line there, uh, how our nation's power is being generated, just less than 30% coming from fossil fuels this morning. Uh, then you have the rise in global temperature uh, since records began. Then the estimated time uh, till we have a rise of one and a half degrees Celsius. And then that huge figure at the bottom there, the total CO2 emissions in millions of tonnes. Just a reminder that you can get all the latest on the Sky News Daily Climate Show, airing every weekday evening at half past six. 
uh, more earthquakes have rattled the Spanish island of La Palma as the lava flow from the erupting volcano surged when part of the crater collapsed. Officials said they didn't expect to evacuate any more people from the area because the molten rock was following the same route to the sea as earlier flows. More than a thousand properties, mostly homes, have been partially or completely destroyed by the lava. The first treatment for sickle cell disease in over 20 years will be rolled out to thousands of patients in England. Our reporter, Aisha Zahid, joins us from the newsroom to tell us more. Aisha, significant breakthrough this. It absolutely is. It's been described as a life-changing drug treatment. We know that there are around 15,000 people in the UK who suffer from sickle cell disease. And if we look at what sickle cell is, it's a hereditary disorder. It predominantly affects those of a African and Caribbean descent, leaving people in severe pain in incidents which are called a sickle cell crisis, which has to then be treated with morphine in order to avoid organ failure. Now, this new medication, Crizanlizumab, it prevents the restriction of blood and oxygen that can lead to a crisis. And the NHS says it can help, uh, it potentially will help as many as 5,000 people over the next three years. They're hoping it will also lead to a reduction in the A&E visits people suffering from sickle cell will have to make. So we all hope here that it will help improve quality of life. Aisha, thanks very much indeed. Now, how safe are our children when they play? Nearly half of toys tested in a recent study that were bought from online third-party sellers could have choked, burnt, poisoned or electrocuted a child. The figures from the British Toy and Hobby Association have led the group to call for urgent changes to the law so that children can play without risk of injury or even death, as Jemima Walker reports. Purple car. One, two, three, go. Two-year-old Rebecca is all smiles now, playing with her favourite toys. But earlier this year, a toy almost cost her her life. She mistook some magnets for sweets and swallowed them. They were so strong, they ruptured her intestines. The doctor's faces just dropped. And within 15 minutes of me saying magnets, we were in an ambulance, blue lighted to Royal London Hospital. So I took her down to surgery and they prepped me and I took her in and she was docile, but she was like, no, mummy, no, no, no. So I physically had to hold her down while they put her to sleep. Sam bought the magnets on eBay via a third party. Now a survey of randomly selected toys has found potentially lethal items flooding online marketplaces. 88% of the items examined by the British Toy and Hobby Association were illegal under UK safety law. 48% were unsafe and could cause choking, strangulation or chemical poisoning. There's currently no legal requirement for online marketplaces to check the safety of products like these. This one is uh, a crocodile which has been on sale for the whole three years of our project. Uh, we buy it in every, every time we, we do a test of the marketplaces. It has an open zip uh, with access to the stuffing and the zip actually pulls off and becomes a small part which can be a choking hazard for uh, young children, which is what it's aimed at. But if you're buying generic toys from the third party sellers um, that you really don't know and you can't see their address and their names, they've got no EU or UK address, that's the highest risk area. eBay says it works closely with standards authorities and has filters which block millions of unsafe listings. But trade bodies and consumer groups want the law toughened up. There is no one who is checking that third party retailers are actually conducting the safety checks. And we believe that online marketplaces now must have that legal responsibility. Should we make some cookies? Make. With Christmas on the horizon, many parents will be turning online to do their shopping. Sam warns them to be vigilant so a dream present doesn't turn into a nightmare. Jemima Walker, Sky News. Well, it really is the stuff of science fiction. Captain James T. Kirk is heading back into space. Beam me aboard. Energize. Energize. <laughs> Never anything better than that. Uh, well, next week, the 90-year-old Star Trek actor William Shatner will become the oldest ever person to blast into space for real, a trip he is describing 
as a miracle. One hopes it's slightly less problematic uh, than previous trips. Anyway, coming up soon, we'll be speaking to the president of the CBI, Lord Billamore, to get his view on the Chancellor's speech yesterday at the Tory party conference. Which is has, has just reopened our international borders as of uh, Friday. And over the weekend, we are being inundated with British tourists who are flying in for a much needed uh, holiday, rest and relaxation. So Mauritius has had one of the strongest uh, responses to the COVID pandemic. In fact, it went in through a very, very hard 18 month uh, international border restrictions which partially reopened uh, back in July and fully reopened here on Friday, the 1st of October. And the Mauritian government policy uh, was to vaccinate first and reopen second. So the country is now at a spectacular 89% vaccination rate of adults. It's uh, also vaccinating uh, children and teenagers and is also now going into the booster uh, uh, vaccinations. So the response to COVID is world class. When we reach um, those levels of vaccination rates, we decided it was safe to open the borders. And as a result, fully vaccinated uh, visitors from around the world are now able to arrive in Mauritius with a, a, a pre departure PCR test and then two antigen tests here on arrival and after day five. But now the borders are reopening, hotels are fully re uh, reopening, people are coming back uh, to their jobs. And indeed, uh, just the overwhelming joy of people uh, who work in the uh, travel and tourism sector here in Mauritius of welcoming the world back uh, to the island uh, has been a fantastic thing to be part of. We don't understand that every lake or a pond is a habitat in itself which houses frogs, snakes, crabs, turtles, birds, so many different life forms. Human beings directly depend on underground water source. So a lake or a pond is necessary to replenish these groundwater resources. Welcome back. The Crime and Policing Minister at Kit Malthouse has told us this morning that protesters from the Insulate Britain group have crossed a line by blocking roads. Uh, let's head uh, north to Manchester. Our political co uh, correspondent Tamara Cohen is at the Conservative Party conference. Uh, what did we hear from Kit Malthouse? We know that there's going to be action on this, uh, but frankly, he, he, he expressed a, a level of disquiet, uh, indeed anger, I perhaps detected there, that some might find su su surprising. Hi, Neil. Yes, it's very much law and order day at the Tory party conference with lots of tough new measures being announced. But the key one is that the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, who's speaking later this morning, wants to take action against those Insulate Britain protesters who have been preventing people from driving along the M25 and the M1 motorway in recent weeks. And the measures that have already been announced, these injunctions uh, to try and get the courts to stop them, haven't so far worked. Now, Kit Malthouse, the policing minister, said that the next step is these kind of ASBO style orders called criminal disruption prevention orders. And the idea is that individual protesters who are judged to be disrupting critical infrastructure can be handed one of these orders. They'll have to go to court and get it from a judge, which will prevent them attending and from traveling around the country to attend these protests. But of course, it may take weeks to get through Parliament in order to be activated. Tamara, thanks very much indeed. 
Uh, well, the Conservative Party conference has been rocked by allegations of an assault against one of its women speakers. It happened as violence against women was discussed both on the platform and in fringe events. The man alleged to have been involved was told to leave the conference. Well, last night, the Sky News programme, The Great Debate, asked the question, are women safe on our streets? Reflecting the rising concern in the country. Here's our political correspondent, Kate McCann. For weeks, violence against women and girls and how police and society react to it has been on many of our minds. It's dominated conversation at Conservative Party conference too. I spoke at um, a meeting yesterday and someone asked about the Sarah Reverard case and my, my thoughts. And I sort of said, I sort of tried to gauge the reaction of the women in the room and said, can anyone here raise your hand if you've ever felt unsafe walking home in an evening? And every single woman in that room raised their hand. You know, for example, a chap followed me home while I was walking home uh, one night about a month ago. There was nothing particularly sinister in it, but still I felt incredibly unsafe and vulnerable. And for the next week or so, I was looking over my shoulder. An allegation of assault at this very event has now prompted difficult questions. Last night I was violently assaulted in, in um, the conference zone by, by a man in the, in the Midlands bar. So I do want to just say, take the opportunity to say women um, are often unsafe in places where other people feel safe. And it's really important that we start to take that much more seriously as a, as a society and, and starting with the police. This is the bar where the alleged incident took place. A conference attendee has since had his pass suspended. It's well lit, full of people and inside a secure zone. Yet one young woman was made to feel unsafe here. Others we've spoken to felt the same way. Their message is clear that government spending to make streets safer can't solve this problem when women are being abused in places like this. It takes much deeper fundamental change. But that change is hard to achieve. Last night, Sky's Great Debate programme asked whether women are safe on our streets. Former Home Secretary Amber Rudd called for a rethink. Hopefully this is a moment when we look at the culture and try to change that, because it's completely wrong. And I th it feels to me like people are going to push for cultural change. And that could happen if the men as well reject the situation that we're in now. It mustn't just be the women saying so. For survivors, the impact is all too clear. As far as I'm aware, this man still lives local. Uh, I live in fear. I live in fear all the time. Um, it's affected me as a mother. It's affected me with my job and um, what I wear. I'm not safe at home. I'm not safe out of the home. Um, where is my safe place? Who's going to protect me? Today, Pretty Patel will stand on stage just a stone's throw from where that alleged incident took place. She will promise to redouble her efforts to tackle violence against women. But there's unlikely to be any new policy in her speech. And women want more than words. They want action. Kate McCann, Sky News in Manchester. Well, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, spoke at the Conservative conference yesterday, saying he would only consider cutting taxes once public finances are on a sustainable footing following the coronavirus crisis. He also announced the push towards science and technology, aiming to make the UK a global leader in AI technology. Uh, joining us now, the President of the CBI, Lord Billamoria. Lord Billamoria, early start for you, so we appreciate you joining us. Uh, what did you make of the Chancellor's speech yesterday? The Chancellor's speech was very good in, in terms of obviously putting business up front, right and centre, uh, being fiscally prudent. Uh, however, it's investment, investment, investment. He spoke about the super deduction, which was a fantastic initiative by this government. What we're asking for is for the government to focus on really promoting investment in business, domestic investment, inward investment from abroad. That's to generate the growth, to generate the jobs that will pay the taxes, that will pay down the debt. And, and the more of that we can see, the better. And this is the time for business and government to work closely together more than ever. It was just in May that we were told by the chief economist of the IMF that Britain was in a very strong position with 400 billion pounds of spend to save businesses and the economy through the pandemic and a fantastic vaccination program that we should have a bounce back, a V-shaped recovery. But what's happened in the months since then is we've had the energy crisis, we've had the fuel crisis, we've had labor shortages, not just lorry drivers, financial services, hospitality, butchers, welders, across the whole economy. And we've got a 
recovery that is actually very fragile. So we at the CBI are saying to government, now is the time, set up a COBRA-style task force of government and business working side by side so we can tackle these issues, these crises, together in the run-up to Christmas. This is going to be a crucial time to make sure the recovery is robust and resilient. Given the fragile nature of the economy, though, I do wonder whether you, you, the members of the, the, the CBI are as sanguine as the Prime Minister about focusing, you know, in a, in a large part, on increasing wages, on driving wages up, as that being uh, the barometer of success. There's no question that we would all like a higher wage economy, but we also would like a higher productive economy, because higher wages without higher productivity leads to inflation. And if you have inflation without growth, if you have stagflation, that is a really dangerous position to be in. And inflation is already climbing and predicted to climb to 4, 4.5% four and, uh, and predicted to stay as such until the summer of next year. Now, we need inflation around 2%. If we have persistent inflation, that is something that would be of concern to the government, to, to the business community, because then it could lead to interest rates going up. If interest rates go up at such a low level, the lowest rate since the Bank of England was founded in 1692, if we have the interest rates going up, that affects government borrowing, it affects mortgages, it affects consumers, it affects business. So we've got to try and control that inflation. Uh, and of course, we would not want a higher paid, uh, higher wage economy. Everyone would want that. Uh, you mentioned uh, en passant the, the, the problems that many companies are, in, are having in terms of recruitment at the moment. Yet lots and lots of people on payroll, but there are a huge number of job vacancies. I mean, absent some return, uh, some visa scheme or, or whatever, ca can we get the people to fill the jobs that are already there without reaching out to, well, the continent, basically? We have a situation where we've had the furlough scheme that has protected uh, employment. Unemployment now, people had predicted by this stage we would go up to 10%. Before the pandemic, unemployment was one of its lowest levels ever, 3.5%. Today, it's 4.5%. And hats off to the government for enabling that to happen predominantly through the furlough scheme and all the other measures that we've had that business is grateful for. We've got about a million people now who come off furlough. Will they be able to go into the vacancies that are desperately needed? There are some firms that have thousands of vacancies per company. What we're saying is, with the points-based immigration system, the understanding always was, we don't want, we no longer have open immigration, but can we have access to labor where we need it from around the world when the economy desperately needs it? And various suggestions have been put forward. We need to think creatively about this, whether it's having the Migration Advisory Committee, an independent body like the Monetary Policy Committee sets interest rates every month. If we have an independent body that says this is a labor requirement, you need a few thousand people in this sector or that sector, independently advise the government on a temporary basis. No one is saying bring people in permanently on a temporary basis in the way that the government has just done for lorry drivers, for workers in the poultry sector. It was three months now. They've extended beyond three months. Yep. It's got to be for a reasonable period of time to attract the people in. Uh, uh, Lord Billamore, buzzwords and, uh, and phrases are very, very popular in business these days, and I'm sure, just like me, you are a blue sky thinker. But are you any closer to understanding what levelling up and building back better actually mean? Well, I, I don't like the term building back better. I prefer the term building forward better. We've got to build forward together. And levelling up, of course, prosperity around the regions is crucial. London is the greatest of the world's great cities. And long may London prosper. It's never going to be London or the rest of the UK. The better London does, the better it is for the whole of the country. But we also need to make sure we have prosperity around the country. And that's why we at the CBI are promoting the concept of clusters, like Cambridge, where you have the university, tech around it, and now biosciences. Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, AstraZeneca is headquartered in Cambridge. The more we promote clusters, the more we invest throughout the United Kingdom, the more prosperous, the more competitive, the more productive. And we've got so much to go for. I'm very optimistic if we tackle this fragile recovery with government and business, closely working together, we're going to be absolutely in a great place. Always good to have a bit of optimism at this time on a Tuesday morning. Lord Billamoria, good to see you this morning. Thanks for being with us. Now, six years since her last album, seems the internet is abuzz with rumours of the return of a British music legend. Yep. So you might have heard that a couple of times before. It looks like Adele is ready to say hello all over again. 
Rumour has it, that's a song title, I believe, uh, that the singer is ready to release her next album six years after the critically acclaimed 25. Uh, so over the weekend, mysterious billboards with the number 30 started to appear all across the world. Edinburgh, New York, Seoul. Adele has now changed her social media profile pictures to the colour of the background of those billboards and has issued her one and only tweet of the last few months, saying simply, Hiya, babes. I'm not going to do the accent. Uh, more after the break, uh, including some stark warnings from the Health Foundation that public health funding is continuing to fall. I'll be speaking to them next. Sky's US correspondent here in Los Angeles. It is almost impossible to predict where these fires will go next. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. This gives you an idea of the strength of those winds, strong enough to bend and twist metal. Are you trying to run me over, Sir Philip? No, go away. Look like it, sir. Will you respond to those who've made accusations, Sir Philip? Can you go away? I've seen the dark side of America. We are standing on the supply line right into the heart of America's opioid crisis. I've seen heartbreaking human stories. There was a river of blood coming out of the mosque. That's a scene that you don't forget. Christchurch has been changed forever by what happened here. Cercando as áreas limpando as áreas e progressivamente avançando com os plantios. Isso daqui é uma sentença de morte para os manguezais. Did you know that air pollution isn't just bad for the environment, it's bad for our health too. It'll be windy with persistent rain for central parts and showers elsewhere. Plonged rain will become largely confined to northern England during the morning, with blustery showers developing widely to the south. Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland will be mostly fine, just a few showers there. East Anglia will turn wet later and gales will develop on North Sea coasts. The unsettled windy conditions mean the atmosphere will be well mixed, so the air pollution index, where 1 means low pollution and 10 means very high, will be low everywhere. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Now, a number of leading health bodies are warning this morning that there is one massive gap in Boris Johnson's levelling up programme, public health funding. Analysis from the Health Foundation has found that the public health grant has been cut by almost a quarter in real terms since 2015. 
uh, and that cut has been felt disproportionately by more deprived areas of the country. Uh, here to tell us a little bit more about their research, uh, Joe Bibby, Director of Health at the Health Foundation. Joe, lovely to see you this morning. Um, just take us through in, in a little bit more depth, if you can, exactly what this research has revealed. The Public Health Grant has experienced some pretty significant cuts. Yeah, that's right. So as you say, today the Health Foundation, along with 50 other leading charities, is calling on the government to put an extra £1.4 billion into our public health system. And public health, it's there to help us stay healthy throughout our lives. So it's the work of health visitors with families and babies, services to help people quit smoking and overcome addiction, or as we've seen in the last year, the expert advice and action needed to manage infectious diseases such as COVID. But despite this vital role that public health plays in keeping people healthy, their funding has been cut by nearly a quarter over the past six years. And at the same time, the need for their services has grown. So smoking remains the biggest killer. We need to support more people to quit smoking. Obesity is continuing to rise. And during the pandemic, we've seen increases in harm from alcohol. And as you say, what's concerning is these cuts in public health spending have been deepest in some of the areas of greatest need, such as Blackpool, where people face shorter lives in poorer health than many other parts of the country. So while it's right that the government is committing extra funds for the NHS, without the £1.4 billion needed for public health to help people stay healthy, this will just be a short-term fix and it won't stem the tide of ill health. Joe, just, just in terms, though, of your point that the cuts falling most heavily on those living in, in, in the most deprived parts of the country, I mean, is that in part because, you know, the most deprived parts of the country will tend to be accessing the health services, it, it, w whatever form they may take, maybe I'll be accessing them rather more frequently? Um, no, so I think what's worth understanding is that um, there's a, the funding for the... NHS, and that's the kind of services most people will think about in terms of their yeah. GPs and hospitals. And there's a separate funding stream for public health. And that funding stream goes through local government. And when the money was transferred over into local government um, around about 10 years ago, um, it, just there were different sizes of budgets um, transferred over in the first place. So it wasn't very equally distributed in the first place. And then because we've seen all local government spending cut quite severely over the past eight to 10 years. You know, places that have had to make judgments about, do I put money into social care? Do I put it into housing? Do I put it into public health? They've had to make very difficult decisions. And I guess this is why we've seen in some places the size of the grant has just become smaller and smaller over the years. Because these are the places that have got many multiple problems that they're trying to manage, not just the healthcare system, but wider um, problems that they need to work on if they're going to support people to have good lives. Joe, just in terms of you know, the kind of the more eye-catching parts of your research, we've been talking about the, 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 the deep health inequalities. You mentioned Blackpool. Girls mm -hmm. born there are expected to live for 12 and a half years fewer than those who are in good health in the richest part of the country. I'm just wondering, I mean, what can be done about that level of disparity? Is there an amount of money that can be spent to sort it out? Well, you're right to highlight this. And I think generally, um, we're probably not aware of the extent of the inequalities that exist in people's health across the country. Um, but what we're saying at the Health Foundation is, <clears throat> this is all about keeping people healthy in the first place. So we know the most important things for people's health is around um, good work, good incomes. Um, it's about the houses they live in. And, you know, yes, it's about the food systems, the kind of food they're able to access and so on. Um, <clears throat> so the government, if it's talking about levelling up, um, it also needs to level up health and it needs to think about how it's um, closing some of these gaps in terms of good quality work um, and s support to people around the country. And the public health grant is one of the most efficient areas of spending of government uh, that the government can do. We know that spending, for instance, on alcohol services can make a huge difference and prevent um, a lot of avoidable hospital admissions, very costly hospital admissions. And we know it can also um, prevent people getting 
illnesses and prevent early death. So there's, there's no one single thing that can be done to close that gap in healthy life expectancy. But the public health grant is probably one of the most cost-effective areas of spending for government in this respect. Well, let us see if the government listens to you on this occasion. Uh, Joe Bibby from the Health Foundation. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, let's check in and see how the weather is looking. Well, followers of my social media will know that it was tipping down outside the studio this morning. Uh, England and Wales can expect pretty heavy rain. Uh, largely drying out later, though, uh, but more rain is heading to northern and western parts to end the week. It is cold in the north with a patchy frost and some fog. Fairly mild, wet and windy for much of England and Wales. Northern England will remain mostly overcast and wet through the morning, although Cumbria should brighten up while Wales and southern England will see a scattering of blustery showers. Uh, well, let's just bring you some live pictures from La Palma. Uh, the volcano continuing to erupt there as earthquakes rattle the island. This, you can really hear the power of the mantle just beneath uh, the surface of the earth. Uh, more than a thousand properties, mostly homes though, uh, have been partially or completely destroyed by the lava. No end in sight uh, for the poor residents of La Palma.